you're an action figure. You are a child's plaything. You are a sad, strange little man. Toys, action figures, dolls, merch, phones. If there's one thing you can't deny, it's how almost everything you see on screen in Power Rangers can be bought. Yes, there's a bit of a reputation surrounding the show. It's essentially a half-hour toy commercial. That's the truth. It's all the, the truth. truth. I don't know what else to say. It's pretty obvious. Probably the worst kept secret, but it's interesting how the toy aspect of the show has kept it going despite some interesting rules when it comes to American children's television, as well as the show's production. Are they allowed to blatantly advertise these products? Is every prop a toy? And why do I keep buying them? Power Rangers certainly isn't the first form of children's media to be highly marketable. Other shows did this just the decade prior. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, G.I. Joe, My Little Pony. Hmm, needs a jar. But there are some strict rules when it comes to children's television. For example, you can't just straight up show toys. Let me clarify, you can't show toys being toys, or really any sort of marketable merchandise. If it's for the purpose of selling to the audience, in this case children, then it's a no-go. Some children's shows try to get around it. One iconic example is during the SpongeBob SquarePants Lost Episode special, where Patchy the Pirate has a meltdown and tries to get rid of all his SpongeBob merch. If you look closely, all the SpongeBob plushes are knockoffs, having inaccuracies like SpongeBob wearing a bow tie, meaning they can't be bought. Power Rangers gets around this in a unique way. You can't advertise toys on TV unless they're props which they take full advantage of. For the most part, other shows can only sell merchandise of a character, but everything in Power Rangers can be sold. It's not just action figures of your favorite ranger. You've got roleplay items like weapons and morphers, and then there's the Zords, vehicles, and other accessories for the figures. And when that's all said and done, they'll just straight up re-release the basic action figures, this time with some added gimmick like the famous Automorphin figures, Zord Morphin figures that turn each ranger into their respective Zord, Jumbo Nutcracker figures, battleized armor figures, a flawed and expensive collector's line with many QC issues and an uncertain future. Huh, if I had a nickel for each time this franchise has done one of those, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Anyway, the show did have a certain relationship to using toys. Certain props were the toys, such as the series' iconic transformation devices, Morphers. They would sometimes have minor modifications to them to hide things such as speaker holes for electronics. There's a shot in Time Force where you can clearly see the tape over the on-off switch on one of the Chrono Morphers, but many toys are unsuitable for use in the show, such as the Ranger's vast arsenal of weapons. Many weapons in the line are scaled down for tiny little baby hands. <laughs> which, to me as a kid, were even too small. Guns, <clears throat> blasters, sometimes made the cut. But swords were usually almost out of the question, being way too big to sell to kids. Though we do get moments such as in Lost Galaxy where the Quasar Sabers go from about 3 feet to 6 inches when collapsed and sheathed, because in this case, the toy accomplished being low profile. I guess that's one way to be screen accurate. The source material from Super Sentai in Japan is better than this than in America. When a ranger from in space pulls out their Astro Blaster, they go from having the stump prop to using the toy in American footage. In the earlier days, they would sometimes just lose props, even something as common as the main sidearm for the five core rangers. In Zeo, Billy can be seen assembling the toy version of the Zeo Blaster. Glad to know one of the weapons used to defend ourselves from the threat of evil can be purchased at Toys R Us, which is more accurate than it sounds given that when production couldn't find a prop, they would simply go out and buy the toy. Obviously, things like vehicles and armor are props and costumes. They'd be really tiny otherwise, but Zords are a cool case. Most of the Zord footage in the show comes from Sentai. Megazord footage, much less individual Zord footage, is rarely ever filmed in the US, but one of the few times it has, the toys were used. Some executions of it are better than others. A good one is the Thunder Zord sequence in Mighty Morphin Season 2, transforming the Dino Zords into their new mythical Chinese-based forms. A poor one is the Shogun Megazord in Mighty Morphin Season 3, where they chose to combine a Zord from Season 1 with a newer Megazord from that season. The thing is, they are both from different source material, so the only props they had to make it work were the toys. This would be fine if not for the fact that the toy line recolors one of the arms from white to hot pink. Why are you pink? Leading to an awkward discrepancy in the show. Zord footage, when filmed in Japan, used props much larger than the toys. They would also sometimes be suits for a stunt person to wear, which is typically done more for Megazords. One important reason for the show's emphasis on toys is... Money! 
What, you think Haim Saban started the show for the sole purpose of entertaining children? Many things in Power Rangers can interact with each other. An obvious example is the Zords, but weapons too. While these are typically sold as sets, they can often interact with other items in the line, causing nightmares for parents as their kid can't simply have just a thermo blaster without a battle booster to fit inside of it. But where this gets ridiculous is a relatively recent addition to the franchise, gimmick items. These are usually smaller items with many variations that have functionality implemented across the line. While seasons like Mighty Morphin had items like the power coins, they were never really collectible as all five main coins came packaged together. The first true collectibles were in Wild Force with the animal crystals accompanying each Wild Zord release. They didn't do much other than look cool, but they were able to slot into the Rangers' crystal sabers like they do in the show. The next season, Ninja Storm stepped this up with the power spheres. Based off of gotcha machines, each sphere contained a unique weapon for the Megazords to wield. A Megazord is nothing without accessories. Dino Thunder scaled it back with replaceable faceplates for the Morphers, something I wish they'd bring back. The next few seasons did not do gimmicks until RPM, which introduced the Engine Cells, a watered-down version of the Sentai counterpart's Engine Souls, which had unique electronics in each one to play a sound. Samurai had the Power Discs, which were useless bits of plastic, but they did have a cool feature where they acted as a zoopraxiscope when used on the Spin Swords. Think of it kind of like a flipbook, but with mirrors. Oh! <laughs> Is that how mirrors work? Shut up, Beth. Megaforce used cards, Super Megaforce and Dino Fury used keys, Dino Charge used batteries, and Ninja Steel used fart jokes. <laughs> One extremely successful gimmick were the Ranger Keys, which were little figures that turned into keys that granted the Rangers the ability to transform into past teams. The line was kind of fumbled in the US, so much so that there were originally no plans to release the entire line outside of a few waves, but popularity equals money, showing the power of demand with the keys outlasting the season they were from, bleeding from Super Mega Force into the following year's Dino Charge line. Thanks to being a cash cow, gimmick items have cemented themselves as a staple of modern Power Rangers, meaning the writing of the show has to integrate them, but does that affect the quality of the story? While some weren't the biggest fans of Wild Force getting a new Zord and therefore a new crystal every other week, I was totally okay with it. I liked the collectathon nature of it, and finding a new Zord was almost always treated like an accomplishment and given weight. Each one felt like an event, except these two. Into the jar with you. But they never really continued doing that. Some of these are just given to the Rangers, making them feel cheap. In Ninja Storm, they usually just get the power spheres as freebies from Cam. But don't get me started on the pump and dump that is Megaforce, where you could literally just breathe and be handed several free upgrades without earning anything. Whoa! Check it out! A new card! You definitely earned it, buddy. What? These new cards will increase the propulsion power of your Megazord. So these will really speed us up. Emma, the power of friendship can break the spell. Uh, yes! It's the top of the command center? Here is your new ship. Rangers, your perseverance has earned you a new power. These will be your new morphers and your new ranger keys. You will be able to unlock your super mega force mode. Along with your new powers come new zords and a special skyship. Rangers, you've now unlocked new modes that have never been seen before on this planet. Legendary ranger mode! Bring on the new powers! You've mastered your new SPD powers. That means you can now access the legendary SPD zords. Thanks, Gose! Well done, Noah. You can now activate these legendary Blue Ranger keys for a final strike. Rangers, your teamwork and Blue's determination has unlocked the Mystic Force Megazord. Away! Rangers, our samurai Whoa. friends have unlocked the powers of their Megazords. Whoa. Which should I choose? You don't have to. Rangers, fuse! Huh? Rangers, because of your mastery of the Dino Thunder powers, you've unlocked the Q-Rex Megazord's ability to combine with your Megazord. You've unlocked the powers of Ninja Storm. Does that mean we can form a new Megazord? Rangers, I'm receiving a transmission from the Turbo Falcon. The Zord wants to lend you its powers for this fight. Congratulations, Rangers. Your incredible bravery and perseverance have unlocked the ultimate Megazord combination. 
gimmick items can work, but not as an afterthought. They need to be given reason. A really good example is how Dino Charge handled it. The batteries themselves aren't special, but are just containers for a separate MacGuffin. The Energems, which got their own explanation. Harnessing the power of genocide. Now it goes without saying that people like media when it's written well. Who'd have thunk? All my talk of not leaving things like gimmick items as an afterthought plays into this bit. In addition to selling toys, they can sell the show. I feel like the show being a product itself is often overlooked, pushing the emphasis on the toy sales. The creators of the show lack confidence that the show itself can be good outside of being a means to sell toys. This isn't necessarily the fault of any one set of people, but a holdover from bad practices stemming from reducing the show to being a half-hour toy commercial. Power Rangers Staying Power wasn't made just selling toys. It was made by being a genuinely good show that was engaging and fun, but network executives look at it the other way around where sales are the mark of quality, leading to the showrunners, directors, writers, and everyone else to work around the skewed understanding. It trickles down. Imagine how much money they'd make if they treated the show like they did another piece of merchandise and pushed it out, because it's a product in and of itself. As of the making of this video, Cosmic Fury comes out next month and we haven't even gotten a trailer for it. We only just got the release date a week ago. They're so unconfident with the show they aren't even advertising it. And that lack of confidence circles back to a lack of good writing. And good writing is independent of toy sale. If they want us to buy toys, the answer isn't writing a show to be toy first. Write something that can stand on two legs and then fans will throw wallets. Speaking of fans, we can't forget the most important part of the franchise ecosystem. Yes, fans, including you. Without fans, young and old, buying the toys, the show would not exist today. There's a certain culture surrounding the toy line that makes Power Rangers as a show very unique. It started simple enough, with YouTube toy reviews, the very existence of which is a reflection of the show's emphasis on pushing product. Classic channels like Ranger Collector 22 and JT Mitchell 87 were some of the earliest toy line content creators. It would often be toys they had growing up, and it wouldn't be too uncommon for reviews of this time to review toys with accessories missing. This was even before there was a standard format to toy reviewing in general. This was still a very new niche on YouTube. And there we go, you've got a... Pink Ranger's... I don't know. She wants to give a... She wants to give a monster an overdose of Valium. Well, there you go. Toy reviews prove how much merchandising has been ingrained in fans. Show off shiny toy on TV, buy shiny toy at Walmart. People tuned in to hear creators talk about paint applications, articulation, and sitting through intros. Alright, hey YouTube, it's Dawson right Come on, tell me there isn't a charm to hearing this at the start of every video. The modern Power Rangers content creator, under the umbrella Tokutubers, at least on YouTube, stems from these early toy reviews. There's very few from the early years who are still around today who didn't do toy content. Not only is the content safe from the clutches of content ID and copyright, the landscape 10 years ago is very different to what it is today. Oh my god, he cut his head off! Oh my god, he cut his head off! Okay! But if there's one constant that was around back then that's still around now, it's that toy content is very popular with kids. And that's just across the board, it's not even a Power Rangers thing. I mean, look at Blippi, he does children's content, but 10 years ago he was doing, uh, d n don't look it up. It makes sense that kids would like toy content. When I was 10, I had no money, no earned income to buy my own toys, so I had to rely on birthdays, Christmases, and the odd family gift to get me by. But even worse was, if I wanted a toy from an older season, I was screwed, unless I wanted to steal steal my parents' credit card and explore eBay and Amazon, and a great way to scratch the itch for toy reviews. It can't be understated how massive toy-related content can be for kids in general. Look at the terrible Kinder Surprise Egg trend from years ago, or the dreaded Ryan's World. And as we know, YouTube has gotten stricter with children's content over the years, but Power Rangers has helped pioneer this trend. Except for Spider-Man and Pregnant Elsa, I don't think we did that. This much love for the merchandisable aspect of the show does come from somewhere. The franchise runs on a monkey see, monkey do mentality, meaning kids want to act out their favorite rangers. It's escapism. So as much as they can, the creators of the show want to display whatever new toy you can buy on screen. Cause you can't monkey see, monkey do if you don't have the newest deluxe ninja steel sword. It's almost like a sense of FOMO. For kids, toys enhance their fantasies, and when they see they don't have a toy, they don't feel like they're getting the full experience. And the show since day one has taken full advantage of that. A signature quirk of Power Rangers writing is that they like to shout out the names of their weapons, vehicles, zords, anything you can buy. Chrono Blaster! Quantum Defender! William Blaster! Quasar Launcher! Plug on! Rocket Blaster! Turbo Axe! Let's make it quick! Toretto Staff! Power grips, baby! Tricera shield! 
It's as if they want you to learn the name so you can tell your parents what to buy at the store. It's pretty genius. To be honest, they usually work quite well, but lately they've been overdone, feeling forced in the dialogue. Lightning! Final strike! This no problem for uh, King and Strength! Right! Final strike! K-Man Long Toss! Flying Slash! Mega Spin Katana Strike! Final Strike! Some of the callouts aren't even advertising toys anymore. Yeah, I know they like to call out attack names sometimes, but it's only okay if the attack name's cool. Freelancers, Spectra Blast! Solaris, Laser Blast! Okay, do it! Genji, Shining Attack! Dino Fury Force! It's that simple. How the hell are you supposed to sell Caveman Toss? We're here to toss your salad. Like, what even is that? Or if the show gets lazy, every finishing move is gonna be called something something final strike. They use this way too often. To contrast, cases where it's done well serve to elevate the product they're showing off. When weapons have unique attack names, it isn't so you can find the toy easier on the shelves. No, it makes it feel like the weapon actually does something different. It makes it feel special. Then you have to consider when they shove toys on screen screen for the sake of it. One of the most infamous moments is in Wild Forces Forever Red, the 10th anniversary special where they shoehorn a crappy motorcycle toy. This leads to a very anticlimactic ending where a supposedly massive Zord is taken down by a single ranger on a tiny flying motorcycle. This is in an episode with nine returning guest rangers who literally didn't do anything for the final few minutes. This was done for budgeting reasons as Disney didn't want to front the cost for the CGI, but guess who did? Bandai, the toy company who owned the toy license at the time. Over the years, it became more obvious when they would shove new toys down our throats. For a while, it was pretty inconsequential. A yearly tradition during the 2000s era were the Battleizers, armored power-ups, usually for only the Red Ranger of the season. There wasn't much wrong with them, but they squeezed every last drop by giving the Rangers secondary morphers to use that were just recolors of the sixth Ranger morphers. They really like reusing molds, so nice they sold them twice, just in a different color. But starting with Power Ranger Samurai, it got ridiculous. Cockpit modes, essentially the Rangers putting on armor just to pilot their Zords. What's the point if they aren't even going to use it in a fight? To my knowledge, it only happened once in Super Samurai's finale. This is a tradition that still continues today. The show's toy license and even complete ownership changed hands over to Hasbro, makers of Star Wars, Marvel, Transformers, and My Little Pony. Um, nope, not going there. At least I can't pretend that's a rarity. Yet they're still keeping up with the same tired routines of their predecessor. It's even more glaring now that they're involved in the show's production, unlike Bandai, who only had the toy license. While they've eased off on full-on useless armor, they still release cockpit-only weapons and other ridiculous new shelf former toys, because I've never seen any of these sell at my local Walmart and Target. I remember when they used to integrate new weapons into fights. Shout out to RPM for straight up taking their steering wheel blasters into a fight. And that wasn't even a toy. It was just cool because it got a practical use. Look at Beast Morphers, an otherwise utilitarian season. They have a goofy-ass Squidward mode helmet they use just to fire a gun in the Megazord. Why are they wasting the budget on such a useless thing? Or how in Dino Fury, they changed the cool, reflective Funhouse mirror cockpit from the Sentai, Ryu Soldier, to a boring gray doll one so they can integrate a sword. I don't know why new seasons are so allergic to using weapons in actual fights outside the cockpit. The current state of Power Rangers as a show is that it's oversaturated with shameless advertising, which leads to lazy advertising, which leads to just general laziness. The show doesn't even try to hide it anymore. The integrity of telling a proper story in a believable world with realistic characters has taken a step back to focus on the bottom line. But it should be the other way around. People grow attachments to things they genuinely like, so blatantly showing us a new toy does nothing. Maybe in the early days it did, but now we're so desensitized. But the one thing that'll always work is to form some sort of connection with the audience. Look at store shelves. While overall, for any brand, toy aisles are shrinking, none more so than Power Rangers. I remember when entire sections of Walmart and Target aisles used to be solely for Power Ranger toys. Now you'll be lucky if the store even carries them at all. This is sad for a show that was once the number one boys brand. The short version of it all is, this is a lack of understanding. The show needs money, toys make money, but you can't sell as many toys if the show isn't really that good. Is the show more than just a half hour long, less than that, toy commercial? 
Absolutely. But those in charge don't know that. No matter how you slice it, toys and merch sales will always be a part of the brand. We'll never see the show without it. A little more focus in the right areas is what we need. Looking at other media, it's clear that they don't just advertise something right to your face. They blend in other aspects to form an emotional response. Super Bowl commercials are known for being off the wall with its humor, not prioritizing advertising the product itself, but using good writing and humor to, at least in modern times, go viral. And it's that virality that sells the product. The recent Barbenheimer meme was gonna bring people to both films regardless, but to a lot of people's surprise, the Barbie movie was genuinely very good, meme or not, and I don't even see merch of that in stores, and every pony knows what started off as ironic 4chan posting turned into a genuine, cringy love for pastel ponies because the writing for the show was decent and the characters were very likable. Why am I bringing up MLP so much? Power Rangers needs to take a page from this playbook. It seems the owners of the brand are content with chasing bygone dreams of parents buying out shelves of toys, but it all came from somewhere. Power Rangers has always had the capacity to be more than just a toy commercial. In fact, it is more than a toy commercial. But the relationship it's had with selling its own toys and merch is a double-edged sword. It's allowed it to last for three decades, but it's also allowed it to regress. What was your first Power Rangers toy? Leave it below in the comments. If you want to see more videos like this, leave a like and subscribe. If you want to hang out with me, check out my Twitch stream, join my Discord server, and follow me on Twitter, uh, or X, whatever it's called. Links to all of these can be found in the description.